Very good. Hi, welcome. As our October Education Night, I may introduce Peter Jeffrey from GKA. Uh, he's a fire scene examiner, and tonight he's going to be talking about the photo ionisation detector. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes, and it's fire scenes and what it can and can't possibly do. Yeah. And are they better or worse than canine indicators or canines? We're going to talk about that because we've got a canine handle in the room too, so he's very interested to see how good they are. Everyone, Peter Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, just before we get started, I want a kind of indication of who I'm dealing with in the room. <laughs> who, who has heard of a photo ionisation detector before? A pig? Raise your hand. I don't know. Most people have. Good. Who's used one? A couple people. Uh, what sort of application have you used it in? Uh, is it in hazmat roles or is it more in, in this kind of field? Hazmat. In hazmat? Hazmat. All right. Very good. There's a reason I asked that and we'll, we'll cover that shortly. So um, we'll just do a real brief refresh on what a PID is before we get started for those who don't really remember or haven't actually seen it before. Uh, these are PIDs. These are examples of two that are on the market. There are a, a range of them out there. Uh, they're handheld devices, so you walk around with them in a scene, point them at stuff. It samples air, and what it's doing is detecting volatile organic compounds. So volatile compounds are just compounds that evaporate easily and turn into gases. And it's going to spit out a reading in parts per million or parts per billion, which is a concentration level. So, we've heard about already the PIDs were used in hazmat applications. Uh, so, why are we interested in using them in fire scenes, or why am I going to talk about them with you today? Um, for that, I'll give you a bit of background. So, like we said, the first commercial use of a PID uh, was for gas leak detection. So, this traditional kind of hazmat application. It works very effectively and as you can see it's still used today for this application. From what I can see, and this is a tipping point for its use in the industry today, um, that's going to keep cutting up. Uh, there was a report published by the US Department of Justice and that was on the potential use of hazmat detectors for detection of accelerants carried by individuals. Now this was from a, a terrorism perspective, um, seeing if people were going to be carrying around ignitable liquids on their person, potentially involved in a crime. And there was a comment made in that article saying that it warrants further study for use in arson investigation. And as I'll show you later, this is interesting because at this point in time, plenty of examination and, and testing had already been done on PIDs, and we'll discuss the results of those later. But this is what I consider the tipping point for in the industry, as just <coughs> two years later, we start to see bulletins released from manufacturers saying, use our PID, it's great, use it for fire scene examination as an arson investigation tool. Uh, these are all the, the great things it can do. Um, yeah come and buy one. So some of the claims that were made in relation to the PID included, and, and this one's a quote, a proven scientific tool used in fire scene examination. Uh, they were marketed as portable electronic alternative to sniffer dogs. Uh, and they say, look, you use one of these, you'll reduce the number of samples you need to take, you'll be more effective, so they'll save you time and money. Which sounds good. Mm. Who doesn't like to save time and money? <coughs> so, I was a bit behind the, the ball on this one. It was only in 2018. Um, I was working in the GKA lab. I was doing fire debris analysis. Um, and I became aware of clients who were using pits in their routine casework. Um, then they would send their samples to us for identification. What I noted, and this is what brought my attention to them, the clients who are using the PIDs, 
all the samples were very strong. So we're getting very strong samples. All the samples were testing positive. So looking at that, that sounds quite good. Yeah, maybe it does warrant further investigation. So that's when I really became interested in the topic and began doing a bit of research on them, how they work. So part of that is what I'm going to share with you today. It's essentially my understanding of the pit and the research as it stands today. And there is the caveat that I haven't done testing on it in a, in a real life scenario. So keep that in mind and I'd be interested to see how that um, compares to some of you guys have used it for the hazmat applications, how that actually holds up in, in, in real scenarios. So that's what we're going to talk to you tonight about. So we're going to do a real brief basic understanding of how a PID works. We're going to talk about ignitable liquid residues, how they present at fire scenes. I'll, I'll try and do a bit of a, a demonstration of what a PID might see from the PID's perspective. And we'll look at a case study of how that would present itself in a real life fire scene. And from there, we, once we've got to that point, I think we'll be in a good position to discuss the pros and cons of a pit and, and form your own decision on, on whether you think this is a valid tool and, or something that could be of use to you. So how does a pit work? So like I said before, there's, there's various sensors. This one's got a flexible hose. This one's got just a tip at the top. Uh, it's gonna pass into the sensor. Within the machine itself, it's going to essentially shoot UV light at the air that's passing through that. And what that's going to do is going to hit the volatile organic content. This is the VOC, that's the stuff we're interested in. So it's going to hit the stuff we're interested in, and that stuff's going to get a charge. And what the PID's going to do, it's going to count up all those charges and come up with a final reading. So, sounds a bit complicated. Let me just a, a clarify how that might work in real life. So, it's important to note different particles are generating different amounts of charge when they're hit with the UV light. For example, you have particle number A. When it gets hit with the UV light, it gives a reading of 5. The EV stands for electron volts. Don't really worry about that, just say when it gets hit with this UV light, it gives a reading of 5. When this bigger one gets hit with the UV light, it gives a reading of 10. Now, let's say the machine's done all that. These molecules have been passing through the machine and it's coming up with a total reading of 1000. So, how does the PID determine the concentration or the number of particles that have passed through it. Is it going to be 200 lots of particle A? So 200 times 5 equals 1,000. Is it going to be 100 particles of particle B? So that's 100 times 10 is 1,000. Or is it going to be some combination of both? And what we find is really the pit can't tell you. It can't work backwards in a scenario like that you have to tell the PID what it is you're measuring. So you have to come from a point of view saying, it is particle A, I know that I'm measuring particle A, so I can calibrate the machine to particle A. So what, what do we know from that? That sounds all a, a bit gobbledygook, um, but we'll, we'll see the application of that uh, later on. What the important takeaway from all that is, is one, you need to know exactly what you're measuring for the concentration to be accurate. And two, it cannot be a combination of different compounds. So, just to reiterate, you have to know exactly what you're measuring and it has to be a combination of different, comp uh, it cannot be a combination of different compounds for the reading on the PID to be an accurate representation of what you're measuring. So think about what we know now about 
ignitable liquids. Ignitable liquids are made up of volatile organic compounds. That's the good stuff that the PID's great at detecting. So that's excellent. That's a good pro. Uh, but unfortunately, we know that most ignitable liquids are complex mixtures. They contain hundreds of compounds in them. So, going back to our understanding of what we've just discussed, we know if the PID is detecting an ignitable liquid residue, the concentration is not likely to be an accurate representation of that re residue. It's going to be skewed one way or the other, either reading too high or reading too low. Alright, so now on the other hand, what do we know about fire scenes? We know that pretty much any combustible material is going to release volatile organic compounds through the normal process of pyrolysis and combustion in a fire. This means that our background level, so all this stuff that's burnt now, is going to be readily detectable by the pit. So now, hang on, the ignitable liquid residues are readily detectable by the pit, but so is all our background, so our couches that are burning, our timber floor that's burning, anything that's plastic, a lot of compounds, or a lot of materials nowadays are made from petroleum products. So they're actually going to contain the same compounds that are found in ignitable liquid residues. This is going to be the main concern for the application of the PID. So if we remember this term, this background term, which I'm going to refer to here on in, I'm talking about anything that's not an ignitable liquid residue that's burning in a scene and producing um, a organic vapour or gases, so pyrolysis gases, combustion gases. Anything like that is going to be detectable by the PID. So what I expect you'll find is going into almost any fire scene, there is going to be some reading on the PID almost constantly, and this is just going to be from the stuff that's burned. So how low but, level do you think, how low level is that though? Yeah, so I, I put the low level in inverted commas here because it's not actually a low level. The PID's very sensitive and what it's picking up is quite a high amount of background. But when we're walking through a scene, I expect if that's the level that we're constantly looking at, we're going to think, well, that's the low that's natural to this scene. So what are we actually looking for in that then? Well, what we're looking for, we're looking is some sort of big jump or change in the pit that might indicate, hey, there's something different here. Okay. So that's what we're, kind of, we're looking for. So if we're looking around, let's say it's constantly giving a reading of 20. <laughs> Mood lighting now. <laughs> so we're constantly getting a reading of 20. You might, you might think to yourself, well, that must mean that 20 is a load limit. So therefore I want to look for anything that suddenly spikes up above 20. That might be how you decide to use the pit. So what are you really doing in that scenario? What you're really doing is you're essentially choosing to ignore whatever reading the pit's spitting out to you if it's below a certain limit. Now we think back to the understanding previously of what a pit is able to detect. The pit is detecting background. The pit is detecting ignitable liquid residues. So if you're deciding to choose to ignore any readings below this arbitrary level of 20, for example, if you're scanning an item and it says it's coming past and it's giving a result of 15, does that mean that's just background? Or could that also be ignitable liquid residue that's there? It's just there's very small amounts of it. So I want to try and demonstrate this. Um, I've created a, a little graph, if you like. Uh, we'll see if it makes any sense. Please shout out if, if it's confusing. This was the best representation, I think, of how we can understand what a PID is seeing. 
all right. So let's call this dark area at the bottom. That's kind of your average level that's being detected throughout the scene. So we're saying we're walking around the scene. Most of the time we're getting a reading of about 20. So I'm walking through the scene and I'm gonna test through this area left to right. I'm gonna scan across this, this small area of space. What am, I, what am I looking for? I'm looking for those, those little jumps in this reading above that background level. So we're scrolling along. We might see a little medium rise. And we start, oh, there's a little, little bit of a high, high reading now. We're scrolling along, nothing, nothing. A little bit of a bump, high bump. And then we're over here, we've got a little bit of a medium bump. Right. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. yeah. Nod your head. Good. All right. I've labelled it like this on purpose. All, your, all the kid is telling you is a number. And that number is either going to be a low number, a medium number, or a high number. What it's not telling you is whether what the significance of that high number is. Is that just because uh, there was a couch there and that couch produced a lot of volatile materials? Don't know. So going back to the example before, to kind of determine in your own mind as an examiner what might be significant or what might be different from the normal, you might decide to set a limit. And this is what we are talking about before. So you might say, if this is, for example, 25 and this is 50, I might set my limit at 50. So any reading that suddenly bumps up above this 50 level, I'm going to consider a hit, a positive. So that's, I think, the best representation I can see just on a computer screen of what a pin's going to see. All right, so now let's compare this to what I think a, a accelerant detection canine might see, for example. All right, here's a little dog. I don't know which dog, is dog that? that is. I just found it online. So it's not our dog. I don't yeah. think it's any of your dogs. Is it not Clover? No. No, no I think it's something from America. So yes, sorry, exactly. I could have done a, a bit of extra work and got. I was eating chocolate or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it could be an old photo. <laughs> All right, so it could be an old photo. So what's, what's the dog going to do? Well, the dog's not going to tell you I've got petrol, but what they are going to do is they're going to indicate. So they're going to sit down, lie down, or, or do whatever the, the signal is for the dog to do. Uh, <laughs> so what you might find, you've got the average background level here. This is through the scene. The reason I've kind of lowered this grey area is the dog's going to be able to distinguish uh, to a degree what's, what's normal to a scene. It's going to be able to say, well, this is a scent I'm trained to ignore and, and I'm looking for scents I'm trained to alert to. So it's able to penetrate through that background level and, and still get some hits. Um, so we get, get indicating getting some good indications that there might be samples there. All right, make sense? Yeah? Yes. Good, all right. Now, what can a GCMS see? So a GCMS is the sample, or is the bit of machinery we use to conclusively identify what liquid is there. So in this, sam in this case, I've, I've called them petrol, uh, but they could just be, um, uh, petroleum distillate, things like kerosene or, or diesel, for example, fall under that banner. Uh, so we're now when we're going further beyond just saying, yes, we got a hit, no, we got a miss, we're actually identifying what's there. And like, like the canine, and unlike the pit, it's able to penetrate past that background level and distinguish between what is background and what is actually might be a residue. All right. I hope that gives a good uh, grounding or a, a good level to all, all work from from here on in. So, so what's our PID then? Our PID's extremely sensitive. Yes, good. So is our GC. 
Unfortunately, where the PID falls a little short, it can't search for and it cannot identify individual compounds. You can't set it to search only for toluene. You can set a response factor on your machine, but what you're doing is you're telling the machine that what you're looking for, or you're telling the machine that what you're seeing is all toluene. If you've got questions on that later, I can go into a, a, that a bit further for people who actually use these regularly about setting appropriate response factors. All right. And the PID is unable to dif differentiate between ILR, that's ignitable liquid residue, and background. So, how does this all fit into a fire scene? What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you some photos from a job that I've done. It's not a job where I use the PID, to clarify. It's a job that I've done which I think shows a good snapshot of how messy a fire scene can be. And I want your input on this to kind of think about if you were using a pit in this fire scene, where would you expect higher results? Where would you expect lower results just based on the background? Okay, so feel free to shout out. So this is a scene, does anyone recognize this? Uh, yeah, okay, good. Which shop, where? It's a barber shop. All right, I'll, I won't say the name of it. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> All right, so this is looking from the front Which entry. Which shop? Where is it? Central Coast. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is looking from the front entry. So if you've got a bit of background knowledge about this. I'm too scared to say a solid. Um, so this is looking from the front entry down into the barber shop. Uh, you can see along the side here, you've got couches along this side, and this is uh, where all the chairs were set up. So we've got. There was mirrors on the wall here, chairs, stuff like that. Okay, fair bit of damage, as you can see. Uh, this is a, a floating timber floor. Towards this front entry, all this floating timber floors uh, burn away. All right. So this is the same photo, this looking back the other way towards the front entry. Uh, they boarded it up out the front. Uh, but you can see this, this was all a window. Uh, window here, window here, and then a roller door entry through the middle. Alright, so what am I looking at when I'm examining this kind of scene? I'm looking for uh, where the fire damage might be greatest, and I'm also trying to determine in my mind is there reasons for that fire damage to be so great? So, who wants to shout out? Where's, where does the fire damage appear to be greatest in the, the image? <laughs> I'll sell the information for 20 bucks. <laughs> well, where the floor's missing? Yeah, okay. So we've got a section of floor missing through here. If we're comparing... The roof's pretty burnt centrally. Yep. Yeah. Any other ideas? It's pretty intact, like the furniture and stuff, so... Yeah, and I'm not asking you to point out the point of origin, I'm just talking about, we're just talking about the general fire damage here. Alright, so notice, there's quite a bit of fire damage over here. We've got couches here. Uh, the fire damage is, is greater as we progress towards the front of the shop. What do we have at the front of the shop, anyone? Air supply, yeah, we've got all the windows there. So we've got a source of ventilation. So, yes, there's a lot of fuel load, uh, there's a lot of fire damage over the left hand side, but that also corresponds to a high, high level of fuel load and also to ventilation. Well, uh, I'll just show you a, a bit of a close up of the, uh, the sides now. So, that's the typical setup of a barber station. So, the barber chair, we've got a set of drawers, they're metal, um, and then a timber frame top and the flooring was floating timber floorboards through the middle. This is what the damage looked like. Mm. So the timber floor, it's, very nice. it's burned away. And you can see even after, after the fire, uh, I think a PVC pipe in the roof was compromised in the fire, so it's constantly flooding with water, just to make things, yeah. 
even better for us. Now we look over to the, uh, the other side, this is our couch. Uh, this one's pretty gone compared to the one next door to it. A lot of damage, again, uh, you're right next to a window. So, out of those three locations, and I'll, I'll say these three locations because these are three different locations I took samples from, which one would you expect to have the highest reading if you were to use a pin? Floor. Bench. Couch. Couch. All right, we have a mixed bag. So we reckon the floor and we reckon the couch, and we also reckon a bit of the bench. So I think the loudest shout I got was out for the couch. We, we think the pin would read loudly at the couch. That was from GJA though. Um, they know the news. Oh, yeah, that. See? Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't know if there's a particular right or wrong answer in this, but if I just think about the items that were there, you've got you'd have the polyurethane foam of the couch, you've got the timber of the couch, you've got the timber flooring. <coughs> this is a head unit for a split system air conditioner. That's been fire damaged, so you've got plastic materials that are being involved also all in this area. So Personally, I would, I would expect this area to have a high reading of a pit normally anyway. Where'd you actually sample on the couch? I'll, I'll show you in a sec, Roger. Um, when we come back to the floor, yes, there was a lot of damage on the floor, but I think subsequently, because it's been flooded um, by water, I wouldn't expect there to be much of a reading there anymore, if there was one. Okay. All right, so where did I sample? I started from the middle. Uh, took some from the tiles. Most of that timber flooring was uh, burnt away, so uh, I considered if it was passed through the entry, if any of the were passed through the entryway, then maybe that would pick it up rather than relying on the, the timber flooring, which was flooded. All right, so this was a sample of tiles. What sort of uh, volatile organic content do you think normally occurs in tiles? Do tiles burn? They should be. Not really. So, and this you can see in the sample. So this is the analysis results, which I've taken. This is the actual result. Um, this was the tiles. Uh, not much in there. So, positive control means this is something we add to it to make sure the extraction worked properly. So ignore that one. Apart from that, what else is there? There's not much, is there? So not surprisingly. There was not much background in this, and there was not much ignitable liquid residues either. Um, this background level, just for those who are interested, I tried to represent what a PID would see. So, the way a GCMS works is it separates all the compounds out, and then identifies each one. So to replicate what a PID might see, I've just added them all back up together to make one total result. Because a PID's just going to be seeing them all at the same time. That's how I got to that value. I can talk about it later if anyone's interested. All right, sample two. All right, I took on the other side along the flooring. I had a lot of low level burning along the, the skirting in this area. So I collected a sample of yeah, the floating floorboards in this location. All right, now we have burnt timber. What sort of reading would you expect a pit might, might pick up on this? Reason, medium? Re, yeah, me, medium level. I think that's fair. All right, so this was the results for it. Uh, Floating timber floorboards. We've got a bunch of peaks now. That's good, that means it's actually detecting volatile compounds. Uh, however, none of those compounds were associated with ignitable liquid residue. So, take away from all this, don't worry about the peaks too much. Um, Takeaway is, Total background level, so the total amount of volatile materials in this snapshot of the scene, about 33 million. All right, just keep that value in mind and compare it to the previous one, which was about one and a half million. So low versus medium. Is that what? No, no. Um, this is just me adding all the, the max intensities of each peak, um, just to kind of give a, a basic understanding of, of what's all there, just to try and compare the samples to one another. It's not necessarily the most 
scientific or rigorous way of doing it, it's just a general indication. The way you would do it is you would calculate the area under all the, all the curves. Um, anyway. So, sample three, I collected from the timber flooring in front of the couch. Um, so kind of at the edge of where that big burn was through the centre, but where the flooring was still intact. Alright, so what I get from this one? Petrol, yay! Alright, so this one was similar materials to the other one. It was floating timber floorboards. Um, so what I did, I went through and I kind of I separated all the compounds out, I looked at them and I added up the totals for the compounds that were associated with the ignitable liquid residue and I compared that to the total number of compounds that were associated with pyrolysis products and combustion products, that's our background. And what it came out was, there was roughly similar levels of, of this sample. So this sample was essentially, we could say, was roughly comprised of 50-50, a 50-50 mix. So the, the ignitable liquid residue level was not much higher than the background level. Is that making sense? Yeah, that's all the takeaway I want you to get from it. So what would the PID see? The PID might see something about 40, 40 million if we add those two back together. So now compare it to what we've seen with the th three samples. The first one, if we say the PID might have seen a reading of about one and a half million, Sample two gave a reading of about 33 million, and sample three might give a reading around 40 million. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. That's essentially what we ex kind of expected just to see from the pyrolysis products normally there. Just from the contents normally burning there, we'd expect, all right, we don't expect much from the middle. We might expect a bit more here, and we probably expect the most over here. Think about that. So what's going on here is there's a large amount of damage in this scene. We have a high quantity of pyrolysis and com combustion products available. And there's a low amount of, there's only a low amount of ignitable liquid residue remaining at the scene. Whether that's because of the time frame which I got there, it's been flooded with water. There's just not much left when I went. And in those samples, there was little really observable difference between the samples that contained petrol compared to the samples that didn't contain petrol from the eyes of a pit. And high damage levels at the scene could generally be attributed to the contents. We've got couches, timber, timber flooring, the air conditioner. Now this is, this is the part which I really want to drill home. If you're using a PID regularly to search for ignitable liquid residues and you're choosing a level at which you might consider is explainable by the PID, it, it might be, in, the, in this case, you might consider, hey, all, all of this is ex explainable just by the amount of contents here. There's no ignitable liquid residues here. And then from that, you decide not to collect a sample. What are you doing? You're missing out on the opportunity of getting a positive sample. You're, missing, you're potentially missing that sample of petrol and getting good evidence that the fire was a result of a deliberate act. So what's our implications for, for the fire scene? And I've, I've just alluded to that. Yes, the PID is very sensitive. It can get down to limits of parts per billion, which is great when it's we're talking about a, a hazmat situation and you've got to be very careful of, of what's in the environment. When it comes to a fire scene, essentially the effective sensitivity range is whatever limit the examiner chooses as an acceptable limit to ignore. So even though the sensitivity is, is really high, the real sensitivity, or the, the practical sensitivity, is whatever that background level is. Because beyond that, it's not going to tell the difference. It's not going to spike, you get, get no changes in the reading. And think about, think about a fire scene. When you go in, what do you smell? We often forget it because we get used to the smell, often. 
it stinks. There's a, there's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of a lot of crap around. All that stuff we're capable of detecting with our nose, and all that stuff is being fed into the pit. So if we're relying on an average reading at the scene, and at the scene we can smell pretty much the average reading at the scene, what then do you think might be the effective range of a pit? I'd suggest it's probably on par with what we can smell. Mm. Even though it's super, super sensitive, the fact that it can't differentiate between the background and differentiate between what actually might be ignited with liquid residue is a severe setback for it. So now that I've uh, smashed it <laughs> and you think pits are the worst, um, let's go back to some of the observations which got kicked me off into to starting looking at it. So samples received by the laboratory. I noted that the clients who were using PIDs were submitting very strong samples. And the samples that they were submitting were in very high concentrations. On the face of it, this sounds like positive result. Like this sounds like something you'd want to achieve, a higher efficiency or a higher hit rate at getting positive samples. When I dug into it a bit further, having now a, a kind of understanding of, of what PIDs are and how they work, um, I, lo I looked a bit further. I looked for that, that reasoning. We found, well, that, that's all well and good, but the total number of samples from those clients who are regularly using a PID was declining. And what does that mean? When we looked at the total number of positive samples overall was also reduced. So we've got a very strong hit rate. We're, we're doing really well. And this is important from this observation. It's not to criticise people who use PIDs. It's to be wary of how you use it. Because the PID by its very nature, if you're ignoring all that other stuff and only taking samples when it's really high, you're going, all right, I've got a spike here. I'm going to take a sample. Sample comes back as positive. That's a great confirmation that what you're doing is the right thing. So by its, its nature, if you're using a PID like that, it has a tendency to dr draw you to over-rely on the PID and going, it worked every time I use it and it spikes, I'm getting a good result, so I'm going to rely on it. Well, the takeaway I want you to take from tonight is not what a PID can detect. It's going to detect um, large quantities of ignitable liquid residues very well and very reliably. What I want you to take away is what it's not going to detect. So from my analysis of this, <coughs> I can see that the trend was suggestive of an overall reliance on, on the PID and only taking samples when the PID showed a high reading. And as I've described before, this will have a tendency to reduce the overall number of samples actually collected. So if we go back to the, the claims that have been marketed by manufacturers, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily intentional, potentially manufacturers don't fully understand the environment of a fire scene and how the PID might operate in that environment. Um, yes, we do know that the PID is a well-established scientific tool. It's been used for ages in hazmat situations and it works brilliantly. And yes, people do use them in fire scene examination. Is that actually evidence that demonstrates that the PID is useful in fire scene examination? I'm sorry, it's, it's not. Um, this is one excerpt which I thought was, was pretty good. This is from Stalfa, and it's, um, look, I've taken this out of a textbook, and the textbook's referencing a, a paper by Casamento, and in they, they tested a photo ionization detector and it failed to detect 100% of the samples that were positive when subsequently analysed by the PID. So that's, that's pretty damning results. And as I'll direct your attention to, this um, was published in 2005. And there was a lot of um, similar studies around that period of time which found similar results. 
All right, let's go. One we're interested in the portable. It appears a portable electronic alternative to sniffer dogs. And yes, they have a similar purpose. They're a tool which we might run through the scene with the hopes of alerting to the presence of ignitable liquid residues. But I consider this statement to be misleading because what it's really doing when it's saying this is I've got a pit and it's as good as a, a canine, which as we demonstrated before, it's not really accurate. The canine is able to tell the difference between the background and ignitable liquid residues. So it's both sensitive and it's selective. It's able to tell that difference. Whereas the PID is really only sensitive only. It's not going to distinguish between the background and ignitable liquids. So because of this advantage, the, the canine is actually has a much greater effective sensitivity than the PID. All right, saves time money on laboratory costs. As we've described, uh, if you only rely on high readings to take a sample, um, you're gonna, there's a chance you're gonna be missing out on positive results. <coughs> when those levels are at or around the level of background, like we saw in the case study, the level of ignitable liquid residue was low and it was on par with what was expected at the scene. The laboratory analysis was able to pull that apart and really identify it and still able to say it's a positive result. So you're gonna be missing out on scenarios like that and that may be the difference between being able to conclusively say that the fire was a deliberate act. So as fire examiners, to support this, we, we assess burn patterns. We formulate hypotheses and we test them. So sometimes there's scenarios where you need to, to take a sample. Um, but that negative result is still going to be telling you just as much as a positive result might. So you're going to rule it to either, you're just getting, a sample is just an extra bit of information which you can use then to either support one hypothesis or support an alternative. Um, so if you're just taking less samples, really, realistically, every time you take a sample, you should have a purpose. You should have, I want to take a sample from there because I'm testing there. I think the burn packet patterns are indicative of an accelerant being used. So let's take a sample and find out. Or if you're in the fire you get the crime scene to come and take a sample from there. So not exclusive to, to us private guys. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're wrapping up the pros and cons. So we're nearly there. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> All right. So it seems like there, there can be no possible pros left. Um, but it's still a great tool from safety perspectives. And this does not mean it is an invaluable tool, particularly from an exposure point of view. What is going on? Um, <laughs> that's fine. So from an exposure point of view, safety point of view, hazmat point of view, it's still a brilliant tool to carry around in your kit bag because you never know when you might uh, front up at a fire scene and you have concerns about the safety. And if we consider the effective range of it is on par with a nose and you're in, you're in an environment where you can't use that nose, uh, maybe there is an application there, but just keep in mind it's going to be very limited. So if you're in this best I've seen and you're wearing a mask, and you can't sniff stuff. To me, I, if, if I have a reason to point a pit at something and see if there's something there, that's enough justification for me to take a sample from there anyway. Cons. <coughs> As we've said, sensitive to both ILR and background. Can't differentiate it. And there's a kind of inbuilt, inherent, uh, kind of an in inherent inbuilt uh, reasoning to over rely on the machine because it gives nice good indications when you get something nice and strong. But unfortunately, there's no real scientific evidence to support its application in the realm of fire scene examination. So if you're then relying on that, those readings in a court setting, uh, you'll get ripped to shreds. All right, so what's our take home message? It's not about what the PID can detect, it's about what it might be missing. You can still use them. It's not a, a ban entirely on them, but 
I really stress if you are using them for this application, you must be very weary of an over reliance on the PID result. Yes, a positive result, a high result is probably going to be positive, but a low result or something that's not differentiating from the background is not an indication that there's nothing there. It just means the PID can't detect it. So on that note, it should never be used to justify a lack of sample collection. And that's it. So thanks very much for your attention. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to run through it. Or if we just want to wrap up. Questions, questions, please. scenario we're comparing samples well again we're doing that comparison this is the only way you can kind of effectively use it in a fire scene scenario is compare the results between one thing to another thing so if you have a negative result here and a positive result here and I stick the pit on it and I show no difference then I might say well it's <coughs> failing to detect the, the petrol that's in that sample I read that to, to me yeah, yeah. It doesn't just the way it was yeah Talk to a canine handler. What they ignore and what they don't ignore. Or Great. Step right been up. some research done. We've, I'm not sure what the community is. Um, Alex. We've some details on the research papers we've done, proving their accuracy. I certainly have come along and understand. Just give me a chance. I don't know the percentage, but when I, I did a research project on this program, the first super dog, we broke down all of the components of petrol, carol, and diesel into constituent bits, tested individually, and then mix them in small ratios. And whilst she was originally, she, she was originally changed on petrol and hero, she mixed it to make diesel. So she was actually able to sort of pick out the bits, like the specific components of the ignited bits. So I guess it could be variable dog to dog. Possibly, yeah. I just say actually with um, Shiva and Matt. You were with the counts that so you got that fair while ago. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually compared them to the GC, see which one can detect more. We actually found that the sensitivities were very similar. Mm -hmm. However, the dogs were slightly less consistent. There were some scenarios where I can't think which dog they were able to detect a low volume of accelerant or a dark liquid, but they missed out on either. Whereas with the GC it's very consistent, um, it's a very consistent kind of conclusion that we can get higher amounts so you can detect them down to lower amounts and then you start to start to lose it. Um, so that was one of the issues. But we found overall the sensitivity was, was quite similar. And this is less consistent with chaos. And that depends on what, what sense they're trained on as well. Some liquids are harder to detect than others. I don't know if it's trained, but from a lab perspective, what would be the percentage of where a dog indicates and then you don't get a result? It's like, probably not transferable, but I, I read a study once on drug sniffing dogs and they had about a, a 50% Yeah. And what you're really... That was the original one done with Ellie. Oh, it came back 97%. Yeah. 
what you're really concerned about um, is your false negatives. Yeah. That samples where it's not indicating that there was something there. False positives aren't really a concern because you're still going to be taking a sample and then you're going to be getting the result. Um, that was one of the issues we had with um, Sheba and Winner, for example. Uh, Sheba at that point was the most experienced canine. She could detect methylated spirits very well. Uh, Winner, no. So that, that, there's a lot of variability there uh, inherent in both the canine, uh, as well as the handler, I suppose, as well. To a degree. Uh, I know when Phil had um, uh, Winner, uh, sorry, Ellie as well. There were a few times when the uh, the canine indicated, mm. and then the GCMS didn't, because uh, in those days um, the GCMS was only going down to the point one, was it? Or, uh, sure. Yeah, whatever. It might yeah. Whereas the dogs were being trained on point zero five, mm. so they had to sort of come up with um, systems in place to sort of train them a bit higher, and then there's yeah. systems to come down lower. But that, that was also why they were never seen to be the positive. didn't go into too much detail on, on dogs because we've had previous presentations on that. Yeah. Know, Alex has spoken about it previously. We, we know dogs are great, essentially. Um, they're so, to my opinion, surprisingly great. It's, it's amazing how they work. Yeah. Do people use the lids to um, like map out uh, a, a large site from room to room, area to area, and everything like that? Not that I'm aware of. Any other questions? Sure. Any dog questions? <laughs> For the handler while he's here. Because he's in O's at all, doesn't he? So he's getting up. Well, Peter, thank you very much. Here's a uh, beautiful bottle from my load who went deep into my cellar to, uh, to find that. That was shops. But um, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, as you can see, uh, PIDs are sort of uh, one of those things. I hadn't really sort of, the presentation was good because, you know, I, I thought pre-IDs would be more popular. Mm. But what you're saying is that if you can smell it, uh, probably the PID is going to indicate. Whereas if you can't smell it, the PID is probably going to be in that range, sort of low yeah. to medium, which, oh, shall I sample, shall I not sample? Yeah. So, again, like, like we were saying before, it's not that the pit's not detecting that stuff. Mm. It's coming through and it's detecting. It's just not, you're not really seeing any difference. Mm. Yeah. I think so, one of the, the telling things as well is that um, all the samples that you brought up before, which were from the um, guys that had the pits, and they were all very strongly positive, yeah. most of those you could smell anyway. Yes. You'd open up the tip. So what's the point? Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Oh. How expensive is it to train a dog versus buying a pit? Actually, I was going to ask that. How much was it? How much are the pits? I don't know. Never that. Oh, you don't know that? I don't Can we get a quote from him? Three grand or something? Five grand? Yeah. Any of the hazmat uh, tests? No. But that's one of the, that's one of the, the kind of the things that I'm trying to to get away from is people comparing pits and dogs. Right. I, I think they're they're in different they're in different realms. Yeah. The question's been asked: How much does a dog cost? Right. Yeah. Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. <laughs> so you your dog. Three if you go to the pound. <laughs> So if, if people come in and s try and suggest that you should be getting rid of the dogs and bringing these in instead, you, no. can, you can say, definitely. No, but if that's really us. expensive <laughs> and it's really low volume success rate, or, you know, it's over relied on for the wrong reasons, yeah. it's not really worth it then, is it? If it's so, an expensive tool. Yeah, the way we value our dogs is, um, well, they, they cost us five grand to, to purchase, and then you've got about six months of training so then you have a handler that uh, is obviously working with that dog 24-7 and then you've got a, uh, a vehicle mm -hmm. 
with that dog as well, and you've got to feed it and house it 24-7. Uh, so uh, if you look at the wage of a handler, the wage of the cost of a car, uh, food's probably not that much, but they're Labradors, so they like to eat. But no, you, you, you're talking well over $100,000 a year. Um, so to, I'll ask the employees. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think Bill used to say that about a quarter million bucks investment um, over its, you know, over its lifetime. It's probably even longer. You know, they they look at um, between seven and ten years. I think is it, Craig? Seven or ten years. Yeah, they try and get about five hundred jobs out of them. So you know how many jobs they do a year. So um, yeah, it's a significant investment, especially from state government point of view, and. Um, you know, we, uh, we have three of them as well, so. Are they doing other drugs, or is it the only thing they train for? No, because I want to detect canines, that's it. But they, they've got five liquids that they train on, but they constantly train every day. Every day they're out there uh, doing things. So they're either on the drug or training? Yep, exactly. exactly. So another question. <laughs> so sure. This is new to me. Um, when you're going in to investigate a crime a scene, a fire scene, yep. How long is it consistent time frame that you allow for yourselves to go in and start using your equipment? Or like so if the incident is cleared as safe to go in, is there a certain amount of time you wait or you just go straight in or and is that consistent or is it inconsistent per site? Well there's a difference between private and public. Yeah. Ah, so, that's so the public um, we go in when the scene's hot and been secured uh, and uh, as well as police, so we have to have that scene secured and we do the excavation together uh, because if we don't know if a crime's been committed, but if it has, then crime scene officers need to have that scene pristine and if evidence is going to be gained or, or collected, they are the only ones that can do that. Once we complete our investigation, we then hand the scene back to the owner uh, or the insurance company and then these guys may be engaged to, to do examination, it could be a couple of days, could be a couple of weeks, could be a couple of months afterwards, <laughs> and you don't know what's happened at that scene in terms of security and all that type of stuff. So they go in and do what they need to do, uh, which is generally sometimes we go to see, sometimes we don't. So they might have an unexcavated scene, they might have an excavated scene. So I guess that's well, how it's, yeah, uh, how it's that's, done. That's pretty good. So it depends on yeah. what's, you know, they do their best to get out there as quickly as they can. Depends on how quickly the insurance company engages them and says, get out there to do what yeah. you need to do. So that would affect the results too, though, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Just, just one point on PIDs from a hazmat perspective. Yeah. It's, even from a hazmat perspective, we don't rely on the PIDs. We've got a bunch of other detectors that we cross-check. You know, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, PIDs, yeah. flame ionisation detectors, yes. um, the lasers, so and the whole range of detectors mm. that we cross-check. Well, so but that's yeah, but yeah. that's in, the, in the, the aim is to identify the substance. So that's why you're doing that. Is that right? I oh. think it's more about sometimes you can't identify the substance, but by cross checking, you eliminate certain things. There you yeah. go. Yep. I think PID is very sensitive. Yeah. I, think, I think that's that's probably the the one bonus that has for it. Um, yeah, you're going to be. Have, it's the most likely to be able to detect something's there. Mm. It's probably not very good at determining what's there. So that's why you would use other tools. I don't know if that's consistent yeah, with so your experience. Now we're on the pool of what it could be by eliminating yeah. some yeah, chemical classes. Any more questions? No. Oh, <laughs> Any more questions? That's fine. Are you have any questions? Great, excellent. Thank you again. Uh, so uh, from our next education night will be our social night in December. And Miss Scott is organising that. Would you like to say a few words about that? Come out the front, in front of the camera. Uh, no, I'm not going to go in front oh. of the camera. Um, 5th of December, I think it is, the Thursday, first Thursday of December. It's um, at the Winston, in Winston Hill. Um, there'll be some cocktail food and some drinks. Um, and we'll have a presentation looking into fire and human behaviour for the psychology behind arson. Yes, we're looking at all of you. <laughs> so, especially these people over here. Uh, so that's Thursday the 5th of December, first Thursday in December, out at Winston Hills. So hopefully you can all join us for that. Thank you again. and.
Good night. <coughs> <coughs>